Thank you so much, Barry, and thank you so much for co uh, to Colleen and to the delegates for trusting me with this very first virtual chapter of Leaders Walk. I think this is so exciting. Welcome to our delegates from East Africa. We're so thrilled to have you as part of our community. Um, I know that I speak on behalf of many of our attendees that have traveled up to East Africa. You guys have just got such a wonderful culture, and we look forward to building great connection and networks with you. So today, I am going to be talking to you about the eight traits of uncommon achievers from all walks of life. But we have 20 minutes and eight traits, so we're going to have to track through this pretty quickly, folks. And I really want to encourage you to, um, to just lay aside your phone and just get quiet. It's only 20 minutes and take in um, the learnings and the lessons from this, because now more than ever, we need leaders. In every walk of life, we don't need to look very far to see the consequences when we don't have the leadership that we all need. Whether that's at school, whether that's in your business, whether that's in your home, uh, or whether that's you know at a, in, in government and obviously um, at senior corporate levels. So without any further ado, let's get straight into it. Somebody once said to me that your life can serve as either an inspiration or as a warning. Now, most of us have met somebody that is um, you know, an accident waiting to happen. So what is the opposite of an accident waiting to happen? Well, it's what we're looking for, if you think about it, in a boss, in a CEO, in a business partner, in a candidate that we want to employ, these leadership qualities and the traits that we're talking about today. And perhaps one of, a word that could sum that up is the word formidable. We're looking for formidable leadership. Somebody that is to be reckoned with, somebody that we can respect, not somebody that has all of the answers because nobody has all of the answers, but we want somebody who demonstrates the powerful combination of competence and character. Competence and character. We focus so much on the competence, folks, but again, look around you. The leaders that you look to, to lead you and guide you, the ones that command your respect, are able to layer their competence into the depth and the breadth of their character. And we're looking for the kind of people that seem to be creating and shaping their own experience of the world. The problem is that for the most part, and I realize this is changing somewhat, but for the most part, schools don't teach us how to be formidable. They teach us how to be compliant and how to uh, remember and retain information. They, they teach us how to be on the lookout for shortcuts. But teaching us how to fail quickly and learn from those failures and how to innovate and how to become formidable leaders is not something that we're going to learn from school. What I'm sharing with you now is the culmination of a lot of research that's been done, as I said at the onset, of leaders of all walks of life. The one thing that is true across the board is that formidable leaders are willing to ask themselves the tough questions. Knowing they don't have the answers doesn't, doesn't mean that they shy away from going on the quest to find the answers. So, the first trait of a great leader is self-reliance. Self-belief is immensely powerful, and the most successful um, people believe in themselves, sometimes always to the, almost to the point of delusion, although I'm not encouraging that. And they cultivate this self-reliance and this self-belief and this self-confidence. As they get more information um, about uh, their, their own performance, they use that information to overcome their weaknesses and to build greater competencies so that they can trust in themselves to deliver the results that they need to, de to deliver. If you don't believe in yourself, it's difficult to let yourself have contrarian or innovative ideas about the future. If you don't believe in yourself, you're not going to make the, the leadership contribution to the conversations that you could and should be making. If you don't trust yourself, when you're faced with a brand new circumstance, as we all are right now in the throes of it with COVID, then where would you draw the strength and the confidence to approach that problem? As many of you know, I do a lot of work in sales training and somebody turned to me and said, they were in, a, in a professional services and consulting and they said, how can you sell something when you have to actually craft the solution. And I simply said, when you engage with an architect, you're not buying the finished plans. You are buying the confidence that you have in the architect and the 
confidence that the architect has in himself to be able to draft the plan that is, that is going to uh, you know, create the home or the commercial space and the environment that you want. So you may not have all the answers, that's okay, but trust yourself to find the best approach. And I love this. The hardest work that you will do is to learn to depend on your inner self because you've been taught to look to somebody else. Folks, there comes a point. I know we're all looking to leaders, but as leaders, there will be times, without a doubt, when you will be lonely and you will find that there is nobody that can answer your question and you will need to draw from your own inner wisdom. The second trait is the ability to listen and to take in information. One of my favorite poems is a poem by Richard Kipling, and he says, if you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, and yet make allowances for their doubting too. I'm gonna to say that again. If you can trust yourself when everybody doubts you, but at the same time, listen and entertain the doubts of others, then you have this ability to hold two seemingly conflicting ideas at the same time and allow yourself to go through the process of reasoning and making a judgment. There is this very famous story of the Titanic that set out the biggest ship in history that set out on this historic and ultimately very tragic cruise. You may not know, and if you go back and watch the movie again, it is in the movie, that there were actually several warnings that went out to the ship, to the captain of the ship and to those that were in charge of the communication. But the problem was there were so many messages of congratulations coming in that when they saw the warning, they didn't heed it. And the captain of the ship went to the owner of the cruise liner and he told him about the warning and the owner of the cruise liner had sunk so much money into the Titanic and he needed this maiden voyage to be much faster and more pleasant than any other voyage in history. And they made the fatal flaw, the fatal flaw of not acting on the information that they had. And it was largely because they'd already invested so much. Isn't that something that we can relate to? Haven't you invested in your business? Folks, before this, I was a, an on-stage speaker. On my website, it still tells you that I, you know, I've, I've spoken um, in 11 countries. That whole paradigm has changed and holding on to that isn't going to be beneficial. I need to listen to what people need and what the market's doing. And at the core of it, the most important thing is what do my customers want? What matters to them? So good leaders have this ability to maintain their confidence but still listen and they know when to act. Then, a true leader will focus forward. So actually, the research term is focus forward, but I use the term forgiveness because so often what keeps us stuck in yesterday is the trauma of yesterday. And when we talk about forgiveness, most of the time we talk about forgiveness that we extend to others. But as a leader, that you want that is now chartering completely uh, um, you know previously unnavigated territory you're going to make mistakes and Brené Brown talks about giving yourself a permission slip in the morning we say you know I give myself permission to fail at this thing today or I give myself permission to um, to take a bit longer on this task today if you make a mistake apologize good leaders and good people, and certainly good spouses and good colleagues, these are people that will go, you know what, if I did that, I'm so sorry, and I'm gonna do what I can to shift my contribute, uh, to change my behavior, and ensure that I don't repeat that. But sometimes you don't get that. And you're gonna need, as a leader, to keep your eye on tomorrow. And that's almost impossible to do when your emotions are rooted in yesterday. I love Seth Godin. I've got to tell you, he might be, if I got that, you know, one person I could have dinner with, it would be a toss up between Desmond Tutu and Seth Godin, although I think they'd get on pretty well. Seth Godin says the easiest thing is to react. The second easiest thing is to respond. But the most difficult thing to do is to initiate. And if you're going to focus forward, if you're going to keep your eye relentlessly on tomorrow, then it is essential that you initiate that that you take control of that, and that you keep the momentum. 
In order to do that, you may need to engage in one of the other behaviors that is common in uncommon leaders, and that is the ability to reframe. Cognitive reframing is a psychological technique that consists of identifying and then changing the way that the situation or an experience or an idea uh, or an emotion is viewed. Now, I, I want to be, um, you know, this is really something that, that demands more time to discuss if we were going to do this topic any justice. And I'm not, in, you know, in South Africa, we've got some terrible things that happen to people, as I know they do in the rest of the world, but, you know, South Africa, we're all familiar with what happens. And I'm not trying to take away from that kind of trauma. What I am telling you is that in my experience, and one day, another day, we'll, you know, perhaps I'll share a bit about my story, but I had some really tough experiences in my life. <clears throat> and the way that I have been able to maintain my momentum is to reframe those experiences as learning experiences and to take extreme accountability. Yes, there are things that have happened outside of my control. But even in that, I have the ability to exert control and to reframe that and to take my accountability and to, to decide that this will be my fuel, that this is going to give me the drive and it's going to become the fire that makes me that much stronger. And that uh, option is available to every single one of us. And as I said, the research backs this up. I worked for a station manager at Kingfisher FM in Paul Elizabeth many, many years ago. And he said to me something as a leader that I really found challenging at the time. He said, Shelley, always believe the best about the people on your team. And I really struggled with that. But I had since learned, and, and I was fortunate to work for him, a really great leader for five years. And in that five years, he always believed the best about me. Between you and I, since he's not on this call, maybe I didn't always deserve it. But you know what? I wanted to live up to his idea of who I was. I didn't take it for granted. And the research shows that when we tell people what they are and not what they're not, they actually want to live up to that. So let's reframe the behaviors of other people. Let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's assume the best about them. And let's be the kind of leader that Tien's Pinar was that can really shape those people that you have on your team for however many years there are. There is a fantastic book that I recommend you read called Necessary Endings. And it is written by Henry Cloud. Henry Cloud, Necessary Endings. And he talks about when do you cut something off? Because the one proviso I want to make here, folks, is don't reframe physical abuse, don't reframe chemical abuse um, as a means of avoiding setting your boundaries. So this is not what I'm saying. But as it relates to you being a leader in the workplace, it certainly is beneficial for you to believe the best about others. For more depth, you'll find it in that book. At the end of the day, as a leader, there are so many things that are vying for your attention. But focus is a force multiplier on work. And it's not something that comes naturally to us in this modern environment. According to the BBC, the average human attention span has gone down to about 20 seconds. And for those of us like me who were diagnosed with ADHD before this you know, massive digital experiment, you may even find it more challenging. But almost everybody that I have ever met is well served by spending more time thinking about what they can focus on. And it's much more important to work on the right thing than it is to work many, many hours. Most people may waste most of their time on things that don't really matter. But when you are committed to a cause, being unstoppable about getting your small handful of priorities accomplished really quickly is essential. So you need to know what are the key performance indicators for you in your role at the moment? And you need to cultivate a, a work style and an environment and a culture that facilitates that kind of focus. This ability to focus and produce quality work at speed is something that businesses are actively looking for. It is also, by the way, a key indicator of entrepreneurial success. And we know that we could there's a lot that we could, uh, lessons we can apply from entrepreneurship in our business. 
for the sake of time, folks, I'm going to move past that slide. But really, that slide, in a nutshell, is to say, increase the circle of influence in your life and you will have greater victory. You know this. But as a leader, sometimes the needs of others can feel quite overwhelming. And so we need to increase the circle of influence even as it relates to managing the needs of other people and ensure that as a leader, you're imparting the same value and practice to others because then you're going to find that those that are looking to you are going to be taking greater accountability. They're going to be, have more control over their life and be less needy of you. Now, the next one is something that may be a little bit unpopular. Please hear what I want to say here. It is the belief of... It's my strongly held belief, my personal conviction, that every human being has the right to produce work that they are exceedingly proud of. Work that when you stand back, you think, gosh, did we accomplish that? But I also believe that it shouldn't be ongoingly at the cost of your personal peace. And in a later session, um, and Colleen will let you know about that, we will be helping you to understand how do you balance or, or manage the tension between producing good work and maintaining personal peace and contentment in your life. And when you know how it works, it's, it's not difficult to execute on. But we weren't taught by teachers that had to manage this world. We weren't raised by parents that had to manage this world. And so the toolkit that you need to navigate these times has not been available to you. So don't be tough on yourself if you, you don't get this 100% right. But we need to work hard. You can get to the 90th percentile in your field by working either smart or hard, and that's a great accomplishment. But if you wanna get into the top 1%, if you wanna get into the 99th percentile, then that requires both, because at that level, you're gonna be competing with very talented people who have great ideas and they're willing to work a lot. It's not popular to say this, but extreme people get extreme results. And working a lot comes with huge life trade-offs. I'm not taking away from that. And it's perfectly rational to decide not to do that. You don't need to. You don't have to do that. But what I'm telling you is that the research shows that the world's best leaders, one of the most common traits is they are prolific. They are able to put out an incredible amount of content. I mean... Just have a look at what Business Engage does. It's event after event, it's awards, it's online classes, and how they facilitated this incredible community that you and I are part of today. That is really hard work. I know that to set up this call, there were people on late at night. Right now, Barry's on this call at 10.30. Uh, well, it must be about 11, 11 p.m. now in the U.S. There is no denying it. We're going to need to produce high-quality work at speed if we want to be exceptional leaders. But then another one, the, the, the seventh, the second last quality of the uncommon achievers, the great leaders, is their ability to network. Great work requires teams. And developing a network of talented people to work with, sometimes closely, sometimes loosely, is an essential part of a great career. And the size of the network of really talented people that you know often becomes a limiter for what you can accomplish. And an effective way to build your network is to help other people as much as you can. So when you come to a session like this, go and reach out to people on LinkedIn, send a message, say, hi, I was on the session today and I thought it'd be great for us to connect online. And then if you see what line of work they're in and you find something that's of useful, that's relevant to them, Share that with them. I can't tell you how this has helped my career and how many opportunities that I have today have come as a result of networks that were built many, many years ago. And so finally, uncommon achievers are actually very generous people. They're generous with information. They're generous with helping you to connect with the right people. They're generous with advice. And within boundaries around focus, they're generous with their time and engaging with people. Nobody who is on this, I'm going to put, put myself out there, and you, can, you guys can send me a, a message or an email or something. Tell me if you think I'm wrong. 
I don't know anybody who is the leader that they are today without a very generous contribution of leadership. Somebody who spent time, who listened, who gave you advice, who made introductions, who corrected you, who invested in you. And now it's our opportunity to be that for somebody else. And that's it, 20 minutes, eight uh, um, traits of the great, these are the qualities of uncommon achievers. Um, and I will send a slide deck, um, a copy of the slide deck through to Colleen, but I have also created a little guide that you guys are welcome to go and download on Shelly Walters. And it's just a guide to how do you gain and hold somebody's attention online, just like we've done today. I hope that I've been able to gain and hold your attention. I've had a lot of fun. Colleen, thank you so much for this opportunity, over to you.